Well, this is part two time-wise, but theme-wise, it's more of part one. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll get to lecture two sometime this afternoon. Uh, but I think we're carrying on tomorrow. Is that the, we, we're going to make a plan at the end of the day about what we're going to do tomorrow. That's right. yeah. So um, we're in the middle of uh, the beginning of the main point. So that's right. Um, if you could just stay for the rest of the semester. <laughs> if you could just stay for the rest of the semester. <laughs> <laughs> Right. We all promise to come. What, what we're trying to do is to get this uniform bound on uh, for some k uh, um, on the, the size of a section at, at, at any point in X. And um, <coughs> It's, it's quite elementary to reduce by a, a double compactness argument to a, to a, a much more tractable looking local statement by compactness to a situation which we'll describe. It's to say we have a sequence of Manifolds of the kind we're considering converging in the Gromov Hausdorff sense to Z, and we have a point P in z th this limit space Z, <coughs> uh, and then we want to say that this holds for a suitable B uh, and K depending upon a priori upon P for points which are close to P, points in are close to P. Um, for that to make sense, let's recall the definition of uh, so recall definition of of the Gromov Hausdorff distance. This involves looking at um, metrics on the disjoint union of X, I, and Z. So we can suppose that we have we've chosen uh, suitable such metrics. Um, So we know what it means to say, to talk about the distance between a point in Xi and a point in the point P. Remember the, 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 the yeah. was that clear to you? If you recall the definition of, of the, so what, what we want to say is that um, there exists, well, let's say star, the star holds there exists, say, k of p and r of p, such that star holds if d of x p is less than or equal to r of p. And i, or maybe if you're somewhat an i of p, i bigger than i of p. x is in, x is in x i. Uh, well, probably k equals a k. Um, let's say k of p. There are, if it's true for one k, it's by an easy argument. It's true for, for a suitable for changing this for all powers of k. So, um, but as you'll see, we need to be aware. If it's true for k, it needn't be true for k plus one for reasons that you'll see. But let's let's for simplicity say that, which will be right. <laughs> so, um, so this would be what, what you, you say. If not, if, if, our, if, if what we're trying to do failed, there will be a sequence of x's for which it, and the sequence of you know, bi going to zero for which it fails. So then we would take a convergent subsequence to get some z, and then when we got this z, if um, we had these little neighbor, for each point p, we've got this little r of p, then we can cover z by take a finite number of the, the balls of radius, a half r of p or something that cover z, and then get the estimate over all of xi. So this is, this is compactness both of z and gromov hausdorff compactness of our space of spaces that we're considering. 
So, but there's nothing difficult involved. It's just <coughs> sort of straightforward arguments. Of course, as, as um, discussing with Bay over lunch, this, this, is, this is very non-constructive. We're not going to get any... Well, this is just the first non-constructive step. This is not saying we get any kind of actual information about what our things are. Because every stage we're saying, if it fails, then we'll do something. <coughs> So now what do we know about, so let's, so now let's focus on proving this statement. So we've got some fixed P in Z. Um, and so we know we have these tangent cones. A tangent cone. Remember, we're not saying that this is unique. But what that means, we can choose a sequence of scalings so that Z on a fixed size Z approaches as close as we like to this cone. Uh, and that sequence of scalings corresponds to choosing a corresponding sequence of powers K that we, we, we can take. But then, um, so, because there, there are many parameters and things to kind of get in the right order in this, but so let's not try to write it all down. I, we, we, we try to write it down very carefully in our paper, but so. Uh, let me not try to say it all very carefully here. But let, so let's suppose we, we choose a scaling so that Z looks very close to this cone, as close as we want for our purposes, as we're going to find. Then we choose I very large, so the XI are very close to, to Z on this scale. So we do it in that order. What we conclude then is that we can, for suitable so after suitable scalings and suitable i, we can construct a map from our u into xi, which after we've scaled the metric here, is essentially a holomorphic isometric embedding. So, so, so let's, let's just recall what u was. We, we took our cone, and then we just cut it. We're removing the singular set. The three, the three parameters that we haven't, um, we're just carrying along for the moment. So we like this. So this is our U. But we can, by just writing down the definitions and doing things right, we can embed U inside our XI, not exactly holomorphically, and, and it's not quite, it's a bit different from what we were doing before. Uh, but, but such that the complex structure differs by uh, arbitrarily close to being holomorphic and arbitrarily close to being isometric. So, 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 so essentially, a holomorphic isometric embedding. So there's, there's one other thing we want to, parameter we're going to, to have, or which we also keep free, let's call it, say, rho. So we'll choose, a, we'll choose a point, a distance, say, rho, from the vertex, and a little ball, say, or some little, little open set around that point, which lies in the smooth part of this, of U. So again, all these are parameters that we're g going to be allowed to uh, adjust. But you see, now we're in the same, now, now we're basically in the position that we were before. You see that we have, we have, um, write it down again, xi. Here we have our line bundle. We're choosing the k corresponding to the scaling that we've, we want. It's not, um, here we have our line bundle we're calling lambda. Um, so there are just two things we have to do, and then, well, to get to, there are two things we have to do to get a holomorphic section that we know something about. One is that we would like to lift um, the map here to a map of the line bundles in such a way that the, comp the, the, the holomorphic structures of the line bundles roughly match up. But we can think about that in terms of, I, I prefer to think about it in terms of connections being a of a gauge theory person by training. So we can think of, we want to lift this approximate isometry 
to an approximate identification of the bundles with connection. Secondly, we want a good cutoff function, which is, as we said, is going to have the form uh, beta delta, beta r, beta eta, so, where by this we mean a function on y lifted up to the cone in the obvious sense. So, if we, and by good, what we mean is that we want uh, the L2 norm, let's go beta, of grad beta times, well, just, we just put in the norm of this section, e to the minus mod z squared over 2, small. Well, this is just notation for the distance to the vertex. So this is something decaying exponentially fast, or Gaussianly fast as we go away along the cone. And by small, I mean as small as we we want to make as small as we like when by adjusting all the parameters. So. Um, so we have two, this, so two, two problems. What is the problem about chi hat? What was, the geometry down here tells us that the curvature of these bundles is essentially the same. So the, pr the problem, if we, if we pull back the connection and compare it with that connection, we, we get a, a, a connection with very small curvature, but the problem is it might be close to a flat connection. So we might have non, we, we can pr easily project it to a flat connection, but that might not be a trivial flat connection. We might have some non-trivial holonomy. <coughs> uh, and secondly, we need a uh, good cutoff function. How, how, how do we achieve, how do we achieve this? This is this small. <coughs> Um, <coughs> but let's maybe let's let's not let's come back to this in a moment. Let's let's supposing we've, we 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 don't have any holonomy, and we're supposing we've got this good cutoff function. What do we then do? Then we can just say exactly the same words as we said before. We, we transplant our section to a, comp compactly, to a section over xi, which is not quite holomorphic, but close to being holomorphic, and project it <coughs> to get a holomorphic section.
working on, a spa on our genuine space Xi, yeah. which is sort of close to the cone, but the point, the, but the point where uh, we're, we're trying... <laughs> yeah. The region we're trying to work in is not in the image of our map chi. It's a little bit outside it. Yeah. So do we know that those sublet constants are bounded? Right, so I, that, that's a very good point. Yeah, we, we do... The part of the reason for choosing the hypotheses that we have so the, the crucial thing is that gives a bound on the Sobolev constant, which is what comes into this, this estimate here in the, the Moser iteration. That's, that's a very important point. Okay, so um, so that's, these are these are the two. This is where the work was to be done. Is in these two things. So the holonomy, I mean, this is a problem that actually could occur. I mean, you can more, well, pretty much you can write down examples where it could occur. Um, because you might have, this cone might be something like C2 over plus or minus 1, uh, in which case um, over that when you've, uh, the when you remove the vertex, the fundamental group is Z2, and you really could get a non-trivial bundle. Uh, but so you, you really might not be able to do this. <laughs> but on the other hand, if you take the square of your bundle, then you can, you know, because the, the, the pi one is just z2. So although, <coughs> although it doesn't work for here, if you take the square, it does. You kill the... Taking the square just means you're changing the... Um, I mean, you, you need to do more rescaling, so rather than working in this bit of a cone, you need to go down half the size or something like that. So, so um, yeah. So that's so that that same so that same principle applies if you knew that you had yeah. So the, 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 the same idea applies, but you need to be a bit careful and, and uh, go into it to set it up. You see the, let's just think about the dangers so as not to kind of minimize the difficulty. One of the things you don't... When you take the complement of this singular set, you get an open manifold. You don't know, for example, that it has finitely generated homology. So as you, get, as you, get, as you, make, as you go, go further and further towards the singular set, you might get more and more loops to have a holonomy around, and um, so it could be quite <laughs> difficult. So you, you need to be very careful in how you, uh, you order, you do things in. How about finite order? I mean, if it's finally generated, why couldn't you get a z for the whole That's order? what I, I'm coming back to that, so, oh. so, so saying, so, so, that, so, but, but, so you, need to t you need to take care of the order you do things in, that you can, cut, you can, you can deal with finite order by essentially by the order argument we said. In reality, one believes that you would only get finite order in this situation. So probably that's all that happens, but uh, it's hard to prove that. But even if, supposing you had some, uh, some non, supposing you had um, some non-trivial Betty number, so you'd have, a tor you'd have a torus of representations given by H1 of whatever the space is, R over H1 of Z. It's D, K, say. So we, 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 we need to uh, contemplate that we might have a holonomy abstraction in this torus. But um, actually the same argument works because... See, we don't need these... To, we're always just saying these need to be approximately the same. We can, we can cope with a bit of error. When, when we make these sections, they're not going to be exactly holomorphic anyway. We've already got some error, so we, we don't mind having a bit more error. So we don't mind if we, we've got a bit of holonomy. So we don't, we, don't, we don't need our connection to be exactly flat, but it could be in some little neighbourhood of the origin and we'd still be okay. But then by a, a basic um, famous principle, once we've chosen that neighbourhood, we can choose a finite order n so that if we take any point, there's some power less than n which lies in that thing. So we can always choose some power in a fixed range such that the holonomy is very small, sufficiently small for our purposes. Choosing that power just corresponds to working on a bigger code in which you, a bigger portion of the code in which you're allowed to 
scale up and down, you, you, you need to be able to scale down. So it all takes quite a lot to write, to write that down in the right, to get the words in the right order. It takes a bit of care, but that's the basic idea. So that's... <laughs> good. <laughs> so now we're right, it's good cutoff functions. Um, there's no problem if we just take the obvious things here. That that works. Um, th here because about the beta delta. Okay. So the, the for for the R there isn't any problem because the the Gaussian yep. phase rapidly mm -hmm. as you go out to the right. of R, but the delta is very close to the place where right. the peak of the, the, the Gaussian. Right, right. Phase. Yeah, same, but yeah. that's just what I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So the, so the. That's the Gaussian argument yeah, deals with that. This is, but this is a basic thing. So, um, if we do this at scale delta, the derivative has got size delta to the minus one. So the square of the derivative has got size delta to the minus two, but the volume in which it's happening has got size delta to the two n. So, just um, because n is bigger than one, um, but we didn't. Um, that, Basic, uh, basic principle. Uh, so that deals with that. So the, the, the real problem is this, we want to construct a, um, a this is essentially a cutoff function on y <coughs> for the singular set. And all we know about the singular set is that the Hausdorff co-dimension is at least four. So let's, um, let's just finish with that. So this is, I'm sure this is a, a completely well-known thing to experts, but it wasn't, it wasn't well-known to, to us, anyway. That is it's a nice thing. So what, what we want to say <coughs> is if we have our y, and it says we're not really using anything about y except all we're using is that the volume of balls is comparable to the Euclidean volume, so it's to be very general. Uh, and we have our, let's call it sigma in y, Co-dimension. Well, in fact, the, the, the co-dimension we want is bigger than two. It's <laughs> the crucial thing. Um, how, in the Hausdorff sense, then uh, there exists a cutoff function. What do I want to call it? G. So on sigma, <coughs> vanishing on a small neighbourhood of sigma. On, the, on the, an arbitrary small neighbourhood of sigma, such that the integral of mod grad g squared is less than an arbitrary of several ellipses. Let's say for all epsilon exists. Less than epsilon. So if we if we have any set of co-dimension bigger than two, we can get a cutoff function, which is where we make this L two norm the smallest the derivative as small as we like. So let's um, just do this and then pretty much stop. So what, what, what this... What the, um, the definition of this Hausdorff co-dimension says that we can cover... This is supposed to be a closed, therefore a compact set. We, we can cover y by a finite number of balls of radius ri. So this, for some, some lambda bigger than zero, the sum of Ri to the n minus 2, uh, let's write, this is the dimension of y is equal to n. This is, this is 2 little n minus 1 in our previous notation. That would look confusing. So this, this, this is less than, um, as usual, this, the epsilon will be half epsilon. So the, 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 the definition of Hausdorff dimension means that we can, for suitable lambda, we can we can choose to cover such that this sum is as, as small as we like. Um, and then we can by standard, we can arrange that the we can choose a cover so that the balls of radius say one tenth the size are disjoint. Say so one tenth size. Disjoint. 
uh, elementary covering argument. So, on each of these balls, <coughs> we can take a standard function fi, the standard cutoff on, the, the, let's call it bi, say the ball. So, this is, so it's a, a ball bi of radius ri. That's what that, so I just, I just mean a function which vanishes, well, so it's equal to 1, let's say on, on 2 bi, so it's equal to 1 on bi, supported in the twice size ball, which derivative is going to be bounded by <coughs> some constant times ri to the minus 1. Let's use that notion of a constant. <laughs> so I can write down the sum of fi. This is, uh, this is, uh, this is now equal, this is now a function that's positive on uh, my set sigma, and then I can write, if I take a suitable function psi of one real variable, I can write down g equals psi of f. So psi just, just wants to be something which um, more to something like that. So psi... <coughs> so this, this is a function equal to 1 on sigma, vanishing on a small neighborhood of sigma. So the, the crucial thing is to estimate the derivative, the L2 norm, the derivative of this, but because psi has got a bounded derivative, it's the same to estimate the L2 norm derivative of f. Well, it suffices to. <coughs> so we need to, need to estimate So let, let, let's imagine that these. Let's imagine what actually is very likely to happen: that the support of these fi are actually disjoint. Then we would so that the derivative of f is the sum of the derivative of fi. When we take the square of that, we would just we would know cross terms. We would just get the, so. So this is, this is just imaginary for the moment. Don't you know. Really, So what would this be? This would be, this is size ri to the minus 1, so we get ri to the minus, just was the calculation we did before, times it's supported on a, si a set of volume ri to the n. So this is essentially the sum of ri to the n minus, uh, n minus 2, wait a minute. Um, which, is, which we can make, you know, that's bigger than the thing we made very small. So that would be fine. The problem is that we, we do have the cross terms. But if we only had two, I mean, if, it, if, if, if each ball only met a fixed number of other balls, then we'd be all right. We don't, the cross, we'd only multiply this sum by a fixed number. So the difficulty is that the difficulty has to do with the intersection of balls. But um, there's a simple, that, 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 there's, a, there's a simple way of, uh, Overcoming that, which is to say, let, let's divide. Let's the, the i be the index set. And let's let i alpha be the set where r i is approximately two to the minus alpha. So we can imagine that the largest r i is one. Just about this analogy. So I, I mean, between two to the minus alpha and Two to the minus alpha plus one, roughly, or so, something like that. <coughs> so, the observation is that not because we chose the one tenth size balls to be disjoint, um, not too many balls of the same scale can intersect, or. or so whoop, let's write it down carefully. So if, if, if j is in i alpha, the 
So the, the, the number of balls in I beta, so for all, for all beta less than equal to alpha, the number of balls in I beta which intersect some fixed I which intersect B J is is bounded by some universal number. So we're saying as if uh, supposing we have some balls of essentially fixed size which meet some much smaller ball, cool. then we can't have too many because the balls of a tenth size are distributed. We, we would get, if we had too many of these, we look at the tenth size balls and we would get too many for the volume of the thing that we know. So, so it's just a basic packing argument shows that we have that. <coughs> So, we, so all, all we're using is that the size of, in our situation, the size of balls is bounded above and below by, in terms of the radius, by the Euclidean volume. So in the end, what, when you, let me not, when you do that, you see that, so, so now we can write the norm of grad F squared is, or is it less than equal to, let me just get a 2, the sum over, we can take the sum over rj less than equal to ri, mod grad fi, mod grad fj. Um, but that means, uh, sorry, the integral. Um, because rj is, which would I say? Ri is bigger, so the derivative is at most Rj. So this is this this the integrand is less than Rj to the minus two. Um, uh, and, the, the, and the number of so now if we we sum first over i and then over j, the, the integrand is less than Rj to the minus two. Um, the, the the contribution from the ball of size Rj is what we had before. Rj to the n. When we when we sum over the i's that contribute, we're going to get a log Rj to the minus one term coming in, because at each scale we have a fixed number. So so what what we what we get is we have to change it by by taking over intersections. All we have to do is to change. All we get is we get an extra log term n minus. To log rj to the minus one. Yep. So that's still dominant. Uh, that's still controlled by because we had the extra power at hand. Okay, so that's that's the end of what I'm saying about the technical. This is this is the very the proof of the main thing. Um, Let's go back to how do, how do we go from this technical theorem about the bound on the row to proving that we get that the gromov hausdorff limits are algebraic? The thing we started off saying. Um, I mean, to, 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 to write that out in full takes some work, but to, to, get, but to see that to get the main the main point is, is very simple. It's just that we have we can always embed. So we, 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 right. First of all, we, we can we can choose our k such that these rows are non-zero. So we do get by sections of L k we do get a map into projective space. Um, given, given by the sections, where, where, we, where we take the norm, when we, we think of this as a projective space with a Fubini studio metric corresponding to the L2 norm on L to the K. <coughs> so what we want to do is to estimate, what should we call this map? Uh, say F. 
We want to estimate the derivative of f. So when we, when, what is this map given by? It's given, we, we take the sections, in a local, in local patch, we would take the sections s1 up to sn, say, and then divide by s0. So the derivative essentially has got a contribution from the derivative of the sections, but that's bounded by what we said here. But we get, the only way it could get large is if s0 gets small. But that's just what we've, we've said, that we can always choose an S0 so that it's not small. That's just what we're saying. So the, the lower bound on, uh, on our sections, the, our, our control of rho, gives us a, a fixed bound on this. Is that, is that clear? From the... Because we, we only need to control the size of the denominator. So now when we take that means that when we take xi converging to z in the gromov hausdorff sense, it follows just from the definition that this is a this is a uniformly Lipschitz map that it extends by continuity to a map from z to x. And moreover, the image must be an algebraic variety, it's just the limit of the images of our maps. If we have to take a sequence of algebraic varieties with bounded volume, they're going to have a limit in that sense, and this is going, things are going to match up. So, so what, what you see first is that you get a, you get a map from the gromov hausdorff limit into projective space whose image is an algebraic variety of some kind. And then you need to do a bit more work to show that actually you can arrange this as a homeomorphism and all the other sort of more refined statements that we made. But the, the basic point is that if you take any given points in Z, then um, you can you can choose by taking by taking a sufficiently large K, you can separate them by these localized sections that we we, we chose. So although for a given K, possibly two points in Z c come together. By going to a larger K, you can separate them out by sections. You use a section which is large at one point and small at the other point, and vice versa. Okay, so that's the end of um, this morning's lecture, let's say. <laughs> that, <will> that <laughs> I think uh, maybe, should we make a, uh, does that make sense? Unless we could go on with this morning. Um, so is that true literally on the singular set? Well, we're not doing it.
emission metric. So the question is, how can we, what is the best way of choosing an metric, emission metric on the vector space given data and more? So the thing is anal analogous to saying, what is the best way of choosing a payment metric given the data and more? So there's a good answer to this question, which is essentially familiar. But if we had a metric, H, uh, then we can form the adjoint of this alpha, the usual way, determined by the metric. So we'd like, what we're going to say is we'd like to normalize the metric such that um, it commutes with its adjoint. And it's a familiar theorem when you can do this. Because um, what you know, what you prove, is if you have this property, then alpha is diagonalizing. Conversely, if it's diagonalizing, it seems to see the distance H. Uh, so, so precisely, whether you can do this is precisely the question whether this is diagonalizing. And uh, if you can do it, it's totally neat this thing. So, well, if I'm going to give it to you. <clears throat> so, this is the kind of prototype that we do. We can't all, but we have a good criteria. We can typically solve it. Most matrices are diagonalizable, but we can't always solve it. Don't you like to like? Typically, Farno manifolds have K one side metrics that there's some. So the, this is a the illustration's general theory. Well, we can maybe mention, of course, that with any other methods like Gilliman, Stonewall, Tina, Bot, many other people who <coughs> pointed out this circle of ideas. But the, the, so the general, a different way of thinking about this is that we choose identification of V with CM and where, where we fix the metric on CM. But now the, now the um, we, we can absorb the choice of this identification in the action of um, G, G. So another way of talking about the same thing is to say that we consider an, an endomorphism of Cn, but now we consider its whole orbit under um, alpha <coughs> and um, we're trying to find in this orbit, this just this adjoint orbit, conjugation, we're trying to find a, a normal matrix. And it's just a very short calculation. Let's say that's the same as just finding an extremum of the norm. What will always happen is always a minimum of the norm. So if we can minimize the norm, in our orbit, we will satisfy this condition. And this um, Kent Ness theory says that you can do the same for any representation, any representation of, uh, let's say, a linear group, inductive yeah. group, then you have the same story. You can, <coughs> um, if, you, if you have a closed orbit, Stability of the invariant theory, which you should, then you can always minimize the norm, and um, that will be unique up to the action of the unit. So, in general, I'm going to 
consider would be a, a compact group G. Complexification GC and representation GC on some W. Then, if we have a point W in W, W the closed orbit. If you if you have a, if you have an orbit in which you have the norm, then it's But it's a more, it's a slightly more general way of setting things up, in which we consider, so more generally, we have some, uh, some Taylor manifold, A, so, G, with a line bundle, Suppose we suppose that G and G C. Yeah, I mean I'm sure you must A and we have a lift to this line. Yeah, you don't need to tell them about And then we have a similar story. In this case, in this um, case we've been considering here, A will be the projective space and lambda will be the full bunch of the So we get back to the same vector space. If, if, uh, if we're just interested in a single orbit, as we will be in our application, then um, we could think so we have, we have a single orbit, GC plus A. <coughs> but everything's invariant under, under G. So in fact, you can pull back your, your data, it's just the norm of this vector, so it's simply a function of, of its orbit, but it's invariant under G. So it defines a function of f on g c. So it's like what's called the model. Okay. Um, so so, so we can write you know, we can write this out. And everything can be expressed in terms of the geometry on this symmetric space. G C over G. In fact, everything boils down to that. This is a convex function. So we have a standard version of G of E6 or G C over G. And we know it means a function convex. It turns out the functions you get from this picture are convex functions. That's why that's why the minima exists. And conversely, if you have a complex function, <coughs> then essentially you can recover on the previous picture. So, so studying an orbit in this situation, 
So it's not even geometry of one of these orbits. This is literally just to say we study complex functions on DC and G. We'd like to fit our Taylor Einstein problem, and these are problems in differential geometry, this is the formal way of this kind of setting. So maybe let's talk, we'll start talking about that tomorrow. Let's just talk about the role um, of one parameter sum. This will, this will make it clearer connection to what we were talking about before. We, we, want a, we want a numerical criterion for whether we have this closeness condition. Hmm. Let, let's, think, let's think about our let's think about, think about our example of the um the matrix we take we take um what's the typical orbit that we can't This is a way of seeing why we can't minimize the norm in this non-diagonalized language. So when we conjugate by this one parameter subgroup, we can make epsilon here, which is everything. For all epsilon, these are the same orbit. But supposing we took any, supposing we, supposing we took any, um, We're going to get certain weights of epsilon, for example, epsilon squared. <coughs> or if we took a, if we took a, not too much, too much of a bigger matrix, if we had, if we had um, epsilon <coughs> squared. Then we get some bigger collection of weights. <coughs> so the question about whether, whether under this one parameter subgroup, we what, the, the, the three things that could happen: the norm could go down to zero, that be when we all the weights are strictly positive. It could be not go down to zero, but be bounded. That's when we're allowed zero weight, but there are no negative weights. Or it could go up to infinity. That's when we have at least one negative. So the crucial numerical invariant we need to detect what's happening is the, the smallest weight, which is in the period of a non-zero coefficient. So if we take a generic matrix and have all the weights in the period of if we take one like we said before, we're not, we're not putting in the negative weights. So the numerical invariant The subgroup, then we can look at what we have the, the weights of the action. The question of whether the vector, whether it goes down to zero or blows up, is just a question of whether any negative weights are the sign of this smallest weight. And this is possible, this is exactly where this Futaki invariant, which is the crucial thing, as comes from. <coughs> Numerical criteria of a Hilbert and Monfort says that precisely 
you can detect this ability by restricting to one triple one parameter segments. And the orbit is that. The orbit is closed if and only if uh, this weight is positive. All my prep subjects are always closed, so you always have a big <coughs> Okay, so that's the case of swap. Um, I'll begin by carrying on this kind of formal story a bit, and then get into we're talking about these metrics and code singularities.